we must create a new narrative articulating again why public education has such an important role in each of our societies and why it cannot be outsourced to the private sector. We must make it clear to our political leaders that the commercialisation and privatisation of education is not the answer. What we are what we have been witnessing is the mushrooming of private actors, particularly law fee private schools and other providers, private private providers, individuals, small small enterprises, small big enterprises, which have been pursuing private interest to the detriment of right to education as a societal good, and which have therefore been reducing education to business. As a result, unfortunately, education is being commercialized in many developing countries. I'm wondering what the United Nations can do to help combat the privatization of education and uh, how the powers that be are stacking up on either side of this debate. What I wanted to say, thank you for the question. I think this is a fundamental uh, is a very important question of fundamental importance, and I'd like to thank you because, as I mentioned, the privatization in particularly developing world is becoming so widespread that this is a real concern of the United Nations system. And I think that today, as you know, there is discussion on the future development of agenda post-2015 development agenda, in which education has been assigned a very important place and the proposals by the open working group on sustainable development goals clearly stipulate that states should provide universal free secondary education of good quality with a focus on equity and social inclusion. And if we see this engagement by international community, then there is a clear signal that the question of state in terms of their responsibility will become very important in realizing right to education. But in addition to that, there are also mechanisms in the United Nations such as, for example, the what is known as international human rights treaty body, which look into privatization case by case in terms of when they examine country reports. This is also a situation by universal periodic review of human rights. And I'm happy to share with you that many of these committees have recently been interrogating states as to, for example, in Ghana, in Kenya, in Uganda, Nepal, several other countries, that the government must look into the negative impacts of privatization. We stand absolutely in solidarity with the NUT when it comes to resisting the privatisation of education, both here in the UK and across the world. And it's the across the world element of that, obviously, that I will be trying to sort of explain today and kind of give you a bit more information about. Um, so essentially, I mean, over the last decade, I mean, especially over the last five years, we have seen this increasing, um, creeping privatisation of our education system, obviously here in the UK with academies, the corporatisation of our education sphere. But what we've seen here is, is it could be, you could see, you could see almost a veritable picnic compared to um, what's going on in the Global South and what the UK government is doing with taxpayers' money um, to promote the privatisation of education in, in Africa and Asia, um, which is an absolute scandal. Um, and I, I'm, I'll talk you through a few examples of, of how the UK aid budget, um, uh, run by the Department for International Development, DFID, um, is being used to support UK corporations and, and other foreign corporations uh, get involved, get, getting involved in education, opening private schools. And, and you know, th there is a, there's a strong ideological pivot in DFID's policy since 2010 especially, although the roots of it uh, go deeper than that. It's not just something that's been started by the present government. But basically DFID have decided, the UK government have decided, that instead of dedicating themselves to the universal right to free education, um, they, they've decided to, that the way to promote education in, in the Global South is by building the Etons and Harrows of Kenya and Tanzania. And that's the way to increase educational access, which, you know, it, is, it would be laughable if it wasn't tragic. 
the, give, give you some examples of how this is happening. In Pakistan, DFID's flagship education program is something called the Punjab Roadmap. Um, it, 350 million pounds is being spent on this project, which is a, you know quite a large amount of money. The major partner, and you know when I say partner, you've got to read beneficiary uh, in this project is Pearson. Um, the program is headed by uh, someone you may have heard of, uh, one Michael Barber. It's a serious conflict of interest because Michael Barber, as well as obviously you know being like this with the old New Labour government, you know he's he's currently acting as as you know a leading light in this DFID program in Pakistan. At the same time as working for Pearson and in quite senior capacity, so this is a potentially serious conflict of interest. But anyway, this particular three hundred and fifty million pound project is is is. Um, is, is very much entangled with, uh, you know, Barbara's been working with the Chief Minister of Punjab, providing strategic advice and political momentum um, to the affordable, affordable Learning Roadmap. Now, this is another brilliant coup for them, really. Rebranding re private elitist education as affordable learning. And it's not just limited to Pakistan, that's just one example. Uh, in some, Zimbabwe and Tanzania, similar schemes have seen 60,000 girls being funded to go to Pearson private schools. You know, this is a huge public subsidy. Putting money into public free education works. And my message to the government is, do it. So what I want to do is to focus mainly on uh, the transatlantic trade, uh, transatlantic trade and investment partnership, also called TTIP. And now I want to turn to you, because you are the most important here in this room. Um, as I said, the European Parliament, they will vote on, on these TTIP uh, recommendations very soon. Uh, in the end of the month, uh, in the autumn, we'll, they will turn to, to the TISA negotiations. And at this moment, the European uh, Commission, together with the member states, they are discussing what their service uh, uh, offer should be to the US. Um, so here, you have a crucial, crucial uh, role to play. Uh, talk with your MEP in the European Parliament, with your member of parliament, uh, also at the, uh, at, at the local level, municipality, um, tell them that you will not ac accept that, um, that education is included in this trade agreement. You would all know that some 18 months ago, Education International launched the Unite campaign. There are three main goals, if you like, of the Unite campaign. The first is to highlight uh, and con continuously highlight for governments and to, to governments that it's public education that is crucial, that is crucial uh, in terms of a better world, in terms of ensuring that every education, every child has access to quality education. Public education, which remains uh, the cornerstone, if you like, of social, a socially cohesive democratic society. That's goal number one. Goal number two of the Unite campaign is to demonstrate that privatisation is in fact the antithesis of goal number one, namely quality public education for all. And goal number three uh, of the UNITE campaign is to remind us that we need to do all we can as we continue to, to head towards the end of 2015 to get as many children in education as possible and to ensure that in the post-2015 sustainable development goals, education free quality public education remains a standalone goal. For the last 15 years or so, we've all been able to offer a very good analysis about the cancer of privatisation and commercialisation. But what we fail to do as a global teacher education union community is to put in place the action, the action necessary to halt and hopefully reverse the continuing commercialization and privatization. We are seeing some incredible behaviors on the part of global capital and the corporations they sponsor, behaviors that we haven't seen and hadn't envisaged before. We could never envisage some five or 10 years ago how big these organizations become and how deep their, their influence and reach would become. The largest corporation around the world is Pearson. But when you hear about their business plan, it's even more reprehensible. They charge children fees by the day, by the day. And when they can't pay the fees, the children, the students are literally forced into child labour, selling water one day to go back to school to pay fees the next day. These, these characters describe their operations as low fee affordable schools, affordable schools. 
Well, what's affordable? What's affordable in that when parents are forced to choose between clothing, feeding or schooling their children? Where's the moral, where's the morality here? And where's the morality with respect to affordability when parents are forced to choose? The time has come for a global response. We can no longer do this alone. These companies are bigger than countries uh, the, the many countries combined. They have no respect for national sovereignty. They have no respect for borders. We can't do it alone. We've got to come together in, and deliver a global response where the whole of the response by EI, coordinated by EI, is greater than the sum of the individual parts. I'm delighted that the NUT is in, is, is, has been at the forefront in arguing for the creation of this global response and is at the forefront of continuing to develop and see the, the full implementation of this global response against commercialisation um, and privatisation of education. It was a 15-minute speech. Nicky Morgan mentioned Google 13 times. So again, highlighting the nexus between government policy and private interests. This is the big question for the NUT and teachers generally. The NUT's vision of education and our understanding of the social role of education is fundamentally opposed to the notion of education as being exclusively about developing human capital for a neoliberal market economy but how is it possible to make our voice heard within the profession and wider community? The germ tried to portray teachers and their unions as being about protecting vested interests. Clearly we know that's not true, but we have to make sure that when we are putting together counter arguments, we are doing so in conjunction with key allies. Parents, undoubtedly, perhaps the single biggest ally in this, but also NGOs, people like Tamsin, Global Justice Now, ActionAid, other NGOs that the NUT have been building. A social Attitudes study asked the question of parents, do you believe your child will have a better life than you? For the first time since Social, social Attitudes studies have been um, conducted, the answer came back from the vast majority of parents, no. Something somewhere has gone badly wrong. Whereabouts is the optimism? The optimism is we are right. Our analysis and our strategy and our value of education and children is right. And I want to finish by arguing this can be done, but more importantly, it must be done. How can we present the whole issue of germ and make people sort of illuminate people about it without sort of disheartening them and bursting their bubble to the point where they're totally demotivated? I would start by, I would encourage all divisions to have a conference like this in their locality that involves parents, that involves people like Tamsin, that involves NGOs to bring teachers together to start the discussion. The NUT's um, rep training course now essentially starts with the germ. And this is how do you turn what can be a very pessimistic situation into a very optimistic situation the experience of the new reps course is as soon as you get a room full of classroom teachers and you say, this is happening in your school because of these forces, it is a light bulb moment of, so it's not just me. And I think that has to be the start. You have to break the isolation and to say that, you know, there is some agency involved in this and we can be part of shaping a better vision of education. When you ask parents, do you trust your child's teacher, the vast majority say, Yes, I do. When you ask parents, do you like your local school, most parents say, yes, I do. The myth that parents and teachers are somehow in opposition or at loggerheads is a myth. And therefore, the potential to make this alliance very, very real is absolutely there in front of it. It's just a matter of us grabbing that opportunity. International Solidarity is Union Work.